My name is Charles Epting, and you're listening to the Lost Labels Podcast. Over the last few episodes, I've been looking at the Akron Sound, but uh, now we're going to sort of switch gears, leave Ohio, jump across the Atlantic Ocean, and look at a record label that really, in a lot of ways, was the driving force behind this podcast. When I thought of record labels that really define a location and an era and a sound, um, Stiff Records is one of those labels where as soon as I started realizing what was released on Stiff, whether it's the first Damned album, whether it's the first Elvis Costello album, whether it's Nick Lowe's first single, which was also Stiff Records' first release, um, it really hit me just how monumental and important uh, this record label was. This was a label that it wasn't even just about the music they were releasing. It was about their attitude. It was about their marketing. It was the fact that this was sort of the anti-record label. This took everything that the major labels were doing and inverted it 180 degrees. And Stiff Records, for me, really was the first label that I started looking for at record stores. I would dig through crates of vinyl to look for that Stiff Records logo. Even if I didn't know the artist, if it was on Stiff Records, I thought there's a pretty good chance this is worth listening to. So these next couple of episodes... We're going to dig into the history of Stiff Records. Now, a lot has been written, uh, and a lot has been sort of mythologized in the history of Stiff Records. There have been several books written about the label. There's been countless interviews conducted about the label. So I'm not going to go into too much detail now talking about the history of the label. I'd rather let it unfold um, as these episodes move along. So uh, again, Stiff is a label that, um, you know, you sort of don't know where the line should be drawn between fact and fiction. There's a lot of stories about the label that maybe are true, maybe aren't independently verifiable, but they've become a part of the Stiff Records lore. And I, I think those are, you know, whether or not they they happened factually as they are recounted today, I think that, um you know, so much of what makes Stiff Records great is this this mythology. So just the absolute basics before we begin. Stiff Records was founded in 1976 by Dave Robinson and Jake Riviera, two well-known uh, figures in the London music scene. Um, you know, the, they'd sort of made a name for themselves in the pub rock scene and decided to create a record label that would be anarchic, subversive, uh, again, sort of the anti-record label. As I mentioned, the first release on Stiff Records was uh, 7-inch. By Nick Lowe, the A side was So It Goes, the B side was Heart of the City. Uh, Later that same year, in 1976 also, there were releases by the Pink Fairies, Rugulator, Tyler Gang, Lou Lewis, The Damned, Richard Hell, and Plummet Airlines. Uh, From there into 1977, you get releases from Motorhead, Elvis Costello, The Adverts, Reckless Eric, Ian Dury, um, and and many other great artists in the years to come. But but th- uh, those are the artists that sort of defined that very early era of Stiff Records, that first year or so, um, when a lot of the releases that people like to remember from Stiff Records first came out. That really was part of this initial burst of creativity uh, and artistry, um, again, within the first 12 months or so out of Stiff Records. So already lined up for the podcast, I've spoken to Gay Black, who was the bass player for The Adverts, whose first single was on Stiff Records. I've spoken to Andy Murray, who was the press officer at Stiff Records for a number of years and uh, originally helmed the 1978 Be Stiff tour. Uh, I've spoken to Clive Gregson from Any Trouble, uh, who came on to Stiff a little bit later, around 1980. Uh, and then lastly, and, uh, and certainly most important in the early history of Stiff Records, I was able to sit down uh, for a cup of coffee with Reckless Eric and discuss his time on the label and his subsequent career. So Reckless Eric was part of the initial Stiff Records tour in 1977, um, one of the most storied and legendary tours uh, in rock and roll history. You had Elvis Costello, Nick Lowe, Ian Dury, Larry Wallace, and Reckless Eric, um, all five of them sort of co-headlining. Um, on that tour of the United Kingdom. So uh, Reckless Eric uh, will will probably cap off this uh, series of episodes on Stiff Records, and his will certainly be several parts. Um, But today we're talking to a gentleman named Henry Priestman, who was the keyboard player and singer uh, in a band called Yachts. Yachts are a band that I discovered through my love of Stiff Records, and I cannot believe they were not more popular when they were around because their music is so catchy and so accessible 
It also has these very humorous, sophisticated lyrics that sort of belie what sounds just like catchy music. It, it adds a complexity to it uh, that I think is just wonderful, the interplay between the music and the words. A quick crash course in yachts history. Yachts formed in Liverpool um, out of the remains of a band called Albert Dock. Uh, very quickly, they released their first single on Stiff Records. That was Suffice to Say, Backed with Freedom is a Heady Wine, uh, catalog number by 19, so the 19th single released by the label. Uh, from there, Stiff went on to join Radar Records alongside Elvis Costello and Nick Lowe when Radar was formed. And uh, there they released their second single, Look Back in Love, Not in Anger. They went on to release two full-length albums for Radar Records, as well as a number of fantastic singles. That was Yachting Types, Love You, Love You, Box 202, Now I'm Spoken For, There's a Ghost in My House, and I Owe You. And uh, from there, they eventually released one last single, A Fool Like You, on Demon Records in 1981. So Yachts as a band was only around um, for about four years. Again, in that time, two full lengths and uh, a number of singles on Radar Records. But I think it's fair to say that suffice to say that initial record on Stiff within the first year of the label's existence remains the quintessential Yachts song. Even though there were some lineup changes after that song and everything they released from that point on featured a slightly different band. Suffice to say, remains a beloved track. It was the first song I ever heard by Yachts. I'm sure many people uh, would say the same thing. So if you've never heard anything by Yachts, I urge you to go listen to Suffice to Say right now before I talk to Henry, uh, because it really is one of the greatest tracks of the 1970s, in my opinion. One side note before I begin speaking to Henry, there was a, a 7-inch released by Eric's in Liverpool, in 1977 called Brutality, Religion, and a Dance Beat, uh, which had one side by a group called Big in Japan, featuring members of Deaf School and other members who would go on to do um, bigger things. And the flip side was by a band called the Chutty Nutties, uh, which was a pseudonym for yachts. I was lucky enough to find my copy at Generation Records in Greenwich Village. Uh, Not a very easy single to find in the United States, so uh, for any yachts fan, that is an essential part of the story. Henry, to start things off, I'm going to hold up a, uh, a record that I picked up recently by a band called the Chuddy Nutties. <laughs> wow. Do you remember that one? I do. We see a very, I mean, how many, was that the only release that Eric's did? I'm trying to think. Or did they do one of Holly Johnson's? Um, I think it was, you know. That was meant to be, um, so obviously we were in yachts, and they obviously had asked us to do that. Uh, and in the meantime, we got signed to Stiff. But we still wanted to do it. It was going to be, have you heard of a band called Deaf School? I have. Clive Langer was the first person I spoke to for this podcast. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, you mentioned that. Well, they, uh, it was meant to be us, Deaf School, um, the Spitfire Boys, who contained, I'm sorry, who, who went from, uh, Paul Rutherford was in the Spitfire Boys, as was uh, Budgie, who went on to join Susan and Banshees, and he's now playing, he's playing with John Grant now, I think. Um I used to share a flat with him. <laughs> He's done very well. Um, and who else? Yeah, so it was. It basically ended up being big in Japan and us, but it was good. That was meant to be an EP uh, called, uh, was it Brutality, Religion and a Dance Beat? And, uh, so it's, I think big in Japan always, get, because they had the famous people in them later, become known as the A-side. But uh, in my mind, it was a double A-side. So your contribution to that record, Do the Chud, was recorded around the same time as your first single for Stiff Records, suffice to say? Yeah, literally. I think we recorded it possibly a day, possibly, I mean, I've got my diaries, which are a godsend when you get to my age, and it's telling me all sorts of things that I've forgotten about. But um, yes, I think we recorded it maybe a week or so after uh, doing the Stiff, and it's like, can we still do this? And I know that John, the singer, John Campbell from Yachts, didn't fancy doing it. I don't know why he did, didn't fancy doing it. So we went, well, oh, do we? So the four of us who actually ended up being the, the, the band, of the, the Yachts line that lasted the longest, because John only lasted the first single. Um, he's still my best mate, but yeah, he, did, he didn't want to be in the band anymore. But um, so, yes, the Chuddy Nuddies was my school band when I was. Eight, uh, sort of nine and ten with with uh, tennis rackets. That's we couldn't play, but we could go. You know, a lot of it was twang, a lot of twang in there. What was the Liverpool music scene like in the mid to late 1970s? Obviously, earlier you've got the Beatles, but by the time you're coming of age and starting to make music, what was going on around you? Because I imagine it's very different than what was going on in London or Manchester, for example. 
Yes, it was. I mean, we were, uh, I mean, deaf school were the, they, they basically opened doors for all of us, for everybody, as did the club Eric's, basically. Without those two things, I don't think the Liverpool City one, well, it definitely wouldn't be the, as vibrant as it was and it became in the 80s. Like all those bands, Teardrop Explodes, OMD, Echo and the Bonnie Men, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, they all were at Eric's. They'd all be at the Eric's seat. All of us would be there. Um, we, I suppose we're slightly, we're just a few years older than all that lot. So we had actually, um, when Eric started, we were a band, albeit we were called Albert Dock and the Cod Warriors. And it was this sprawling, very light. I mean, we were influenced by Deaf School. We just thought they were just fantastic. And it was a, you know, I, I've got a song of mine called Did I Fight in the Punk Wars for this? And in it, it, it the second, uh, second verse goes, uh, 75, I came alive and joined the art school, ba art school band. I cut off my hair, I took in my I took my flares or whatever. It's all about that. And that was seeing Deaf School. And there was a, something going on in 75. Because, um, you know, the, 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 the seedlings were there in the UK. Obviously, it was slightly earlier in, in, in the States with the, the Ramones, Talking Heads, uh, television, Richard Hell, all that sort of stuff. But in, 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 in England, it was very, I suppose it was, uh, you know, there was uh, Deaf School was very much a bit of Roxy. Roxy and Bowie, a, a big, you know, they're big sort of... Uh, <laughs> points to of reference and then uh, and then deaf school had this sort of cool very theatrical uh, like old movies or something like that but it was just different to all the sort of you know bands which i was probably loving at the time with long hair and you know this but you, you go and see them you go oh what what's this and uh, so we albert dock and the cod warriors were two two years below them at the art college and we could barely play, which is the same with deaf school. And you learn, you know, I thought I was going to be the guitarist, but we had two guitarists. So I went on keys. So glad I did, because then when Albert Dock became Yachts, we found the Farfisa and that became almost the sound for Yachts was, was that far. They always say cheesy, cheesy organ sound, you know, so, uh, but yes, I, I say Albert, Albert Dock, of course, who, who supported the Sex Pistols. We supported the Sex Pistols at Eric. So that was a bit of a, Bit of a good one. That was a nice little gig. And then I think uh, another important gig in the history of yachts was opening for Elvis Costello at Eric's. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. Um, he, that I just think um, that is probably the moment in my life where you, they, the old uh, what's it called, Sliding Doors, that film. That if we hadn't have done that, gig, and I, I was reading my diary actually, and it, it just uh, it sort of says a week before. Um, oh, oh, it looks like we might have uh, support for Elvis Costello. So we'd only we'd only change our name from Albert Dock in May, I think. Um, and we played we played a few gigs as yachts. We'd slimmed down, so it wasn't a sprawling seven piece. It was five piece, who so we were a bit more serious about it, and there's a bit less joking. I mean, still wry lyrics, and you know, it, we we uh, weren't like we were staring at the floor playing angsty songs. And we'd been we were influenced by all the those nuggets type bands uh, in the states. That's what that's what we were trying to emulate, um, and so uh, yeah, we, we came along in May, probably May June, and we're talking Elvis played what August maybe in, in um, at Eric's, and we got that gig. I probably haven't only had half an hour, forty minutes worth of songs, but so lucky that Stiff Records were were in the audience. They happened to be there that night because he'd been filming something at uh, Granada TV. So that which is in Manchester, and so they'd all come over to see you know him play and happen to catch us. Another thing, you just think if they stayed in the bar, uh, it might be I might not be here now. I wouldn't be here now. Yachts really joined Stiff Records uh, at the ground level. Um, within the first year, you guys were signed to the label, and this is a time when everything they were doing was still new and unheard of and subversive. And I think that even though a lot of the music on the label wasn't punk, sure, the damned were, but Elvis Costello wasn't, Nick Lowe wasn't, um, even if the music didn't fit what punk rock was, the attitude behind the label was, and the, um, again, this subversive mentality that permeated their advertising and their marketing um, really sort of laid the groundwork for punk to come. Yes, that's a very, a very good point. Yeah, it, well, it, we didn't know it was punk then. It was just different, and it was had humor in all those... The cat, and I got loads of badges, the stiff badges and all that, you know, if you kill time, you murder success. And if it ain't 
Stiff, it ain't worth it. You know, all those sort of, they were just so clever. And um, they just took the piss out of themselves and out of record companies and other record companies and themselves. And they had a sense of humor. So I suppose in a way we were the ideal Fit, you know, we fitted perfectly what they they had a lot of. I mean, Nick Lowe, there's just there's wry lyrics there, and um, you know, he obviously it started off more, possibly more as a as a pub rock because that's what it was. It was seventy five. It was sort of pub rock, um, seventy four, seventy three, seventy four. The Doctor Feelgood and things like that. And so I suppose Stiff initially were a lot of those people who didn't Jake man, manage Doctor Feelgood? I could be wrong there, but yeah, Jake was their tour manager, and then he had bands like Tyler Gang. Tyler Gang, yeah, that's it. I'm a police car with the yeah, um, Larry Wallace. You know, they'd all been in bands that probably. Uh, the, 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 well, I suppose it's what you do. Who do you know? If you're starting a record company, right? Who do we know? So they knew all that lot. Paul Conroy had managed um, Cursal Flyers, who were sort of on the, the peripheries of the punk, uh, pub rock band. And of course, Will Birch from the Cursal Flyers produced us. Again, he was like, well, who have we got? It was, you know, he. Pro- I don't think he produced anything up till then. And for us, it's like, wow, we've seen him on top of the pops. He must be good. <laughs> that was one of the things I wanted to ask you is what it was like working with Will Birch so early on, you know, before he went on to do such great things with the records. Yes, he did. Um, again, I don't think we had any say in it because we were just like, uh, what we, yeah, yeah I, rabbits with their eyes caught in the headlights. You're like, this is great. What, what you want to, so literally we did that first gig with Eric's in probably the August. I think we paid, they said, right, come down to London next week or we got on support Elvis. That was at the first of his month long residences every Sunday night. So we did that one probably August did uh, the last one in early September. So we did first, first and the last of his four week residences. And um, as we walked out that second one, they said, right, we want you to do a single. We were like, what? This is like in the movies. It doesn't happen like this, you know. Same with, you know, formed in May, single out in October, working with somebody, you know, somebody from Curse of Fires. Like, oh, right. So, um, yes, Will obviously was, was I, I use the word foist, but it's not meant to be any NASA. It was foist upon us, but he was absolutely perfect. And he, um, it's funny, I read in my diary that it was... Uh, the initial choice for us was one called Semaphore Love, which is on the first album. And the B side, <laughs> the B side was to be, this was my, and me and John, who, who co-wrote, uh, suffice to say, and Semaphore, B side could be Semaphore Love with Strings. What were we thinking of? What were we thinking of? In the meantime, I'd gone away to, I must have been in August, um, I'd gone away to France and, and had come up with, uh, I was missing my girlfriend, who's still with me in the next room and my wife and I'd written suffice to say I written a lyric for suffice to say about it so we came back and John and I polished the song off and, and then I, the fact that maybe even and we just played our songs to, to Will who obviously there were no demos we didn't have any demos we hadn't you know we'd never been in a recording studio before it does seem now you're naive now when everybody's done demos and have got everybody's got a garage band or whatever we, we didn't know we didn't know what we sounded like you know we'd never heard ourselves apart from somebody holding a cassette microphone at the back of the gig and we'd only probably done about six gigs you know so it was crazy when you think about suffice to say the first yacht song and when you think about stiff records they really are the perfect fit for one another because suffice to say is both a fantastic song it's very catchy um while at the same time it's hilarious without falling into the parody category, I would say. Um, so really, to me, that's, um, that's sort of the, the theme song of Stiff Records um, in terms of its lyrical content and uh, you know, musical proficiency. I'm just looking for my... Um, where's my Stiff box? Oh, hang on, yeah. This might come in useful, might it? Hang on. This one, the Stiff... That's, that's a useful one to have, isn't it? You probably, have you got that one? The box set is fantastic. It's everything you need. Right. Oh, it's nicer. Yeah. Reckless Eric, of course. Oh, I was, well, I, it's funny because Reckless Eric, sorry if I'm moved up, I tend to uh, go on diversions, but Reckless Eric was with me at Hull Art College. Um, we did a gig where he was the main act and I was in the support act. So I, in, in, in Britain, you, back then, you still do, I think, you had a foundation course year, which, so I'm from Hull and I went to Hull Art College and, uh, Reckless Eric, or it was just known as Eric then. It was known as uh, Alan Addison, the Flip Tops. And uh, we supported, we, our band, I don't think we even had a name, but we supported him. 
and it was weird, you know. So I used to know him vaguely from from Hull Art College, you know, bumping up people. He used to have rubbish. That was what his thing was collecting rubbish. So you'd went to his, his little partition of where his, um, you know, everybody had their little bit where they did their painting, and his was just full of rubbish. And I remember saying, you know, this is Eric. He was obviously a bit of a character there. And it was funny that, you know, what would it be? Two years later, both of us would end up on the same record label, or very close. I think his was released just before ours, I think. Yeah, that was quite funny. The lyrics to Yacht songs are brilliant. Um, I don't want to use the word sarcastic. I feel like it's not fair um, to call them sarcastic. No, uh, r- should we say wry? Because it, it mustn't be comic. From my point of view, what I do mustn't be comedy. But I don't, uh, humour is great. I love some of my fan. I mean, I love, you know, uh, uh, humour in, like, well, I'll tell, I'll, I'll tell you straight where I got the, the idea for that was uh, Robert Wyatt. Um, oops, the postman just coming. Oh, I always look in case it's a, a 12 inch LP shape and, and it's not. There's one June. There's a, there's a Kinks one June. There's Arthur June. No, it's not that one. Uh, sorry, where was I? Arthur's one of my favourite albums. Are you a big Kinks fan? Oh. Yeah, oh, I'm getting them all on vinyl now. Getting them all on. Well, the ones I've missed out, I'm getting them on vinyl. Well, again, there you go. So I talk about Robert Wyatt, but Ray Davis. There's humour. There's there's Ryan. No, it's not laugh out loud, but and there's a warmth. You know what I mean? That's what, I suppose that's what. So Robert Wyatt. Um, there's one on Matching Mold first album, and I don't know if you know it. It's just it's fantastic. I think called Signed Curtain or something like that. It'll be there some. And he sings. He goes, and this is the first verse. And this is the first verse, and this is the first. I mean, it's a proper backing, but and then it gets boom, and this is the chorus, boom, or perhaps it's a bridge. And I've, I've always just thought that was so brilliant. I mean, when you listen to it first, you start laughing because, I mean, I've truncated it, but it, it's it's a long verse. Just go, and then the second, boom, and this is the second verse, or perhaps you know, it's just brilliant and I thought wow you don't have to write songs about girls and cars and uh, you know you, you, uh, for me for me being I'm not an angst as you probably gathered I'm not a hugely angsty person I'm, I'm not oh dear what was me and my girl, girlfriend done left me you know it's like I'm not like that and uh, there's a lot of humour in my just outlook on life because you don't fucking laugh you cry especially these days um, so uh, I suppose I yes that was it was listening to that thinking oh, well I thought I could write a song about a song you know um, and and it had that whole sort of suffice to say it was like suffice to say you love me I can't say that blame you people go oh no, suffice to say I love you too so yeah yeah I didn't know what I was doing I really didn't I mean that was the third song I'd ever written so um, and and the other two songs were on and on which was. Uh, on the stiff extra single and um, single that came up with the album and Summer for Love. So those three were written with John and myself. But suffice to say, is I came up with apart from the middle eight bit, I came up with the, with the whole lyric. Hence the lyric saying, "I never wrote a middle eight, so we'll just have to do without." Then John came back and he came up with this middle eight. So somebody the other day said, "I love the fact that you say I didn't write a middle eight, but we just thought I'll oh, leave it in. It's it's great." Now, did you guys share Jake Riviera as a manager with Elvis Costello? No, we uh, no, we were managed by by Death School's manager Frank Silver initially. Yeah. But when Jake Riviera started Radar Records, you were part of the exodus with Nick Lowe and Elvis Costello. Yes, the world. Well, um, actually, for us, I think it probably gets put in the history books as a, as an exodus for us. I think they dropped us basically when John left, um, and we couldn't believe he. I mean, we it was you know it was. There was, there was such a, um, a buzz about us uh, because we were totally different from anybody else. We had all the energy, and I suppose we were basing ourselves, we weren't fucking, we weren't fucking, we weren't, we weren't that. We were loving all the sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, the knickerbockers and the, uh, the question mark and the mysterious, the mystery, you know, and mysterians and all that sort of the chocolate watch band. We were loving all that, so it was that sort of energy. I suppose we still loved our melody, we still love our harmonies, three-part harmonies on almost four parts on some of the songs. So we did love all that. We loved pop, but we just wanted to make it, just twist it a bit, you know. Um, so when John left, he was very, I mean, still is, very charismatic front man. And I think uh, Stiff just didn't see how it could work 
without him. And to be honest, I don't think I did. <laughs> we think, what do we do? Um, uh, we did look at another chap from the art college who's now in a band in, in Boston over there where you are. Uh, and it's called, I think it's called Big Bad Bollocks or something like that. It's a sort of punk band. So he did, I never, I, I'd forgot that but again when I last, when I bumped in, he said, do you remember I, I was, for a while I was going to be in the singer in the arts? I'm like, God, I've forgotten about that. I think we might have tried him out or whatever, but it was so different to John. John was just so special, yeah. you know. And, and we just thought, oh, well, let's carry on with me and Martin Watson um, sharing the, the vocals, which is again, it's not an ideal situation to not have a front man. You know, there were two, and I was behind the keyboard, but doing most of the chat in between songs, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an ideal situation. By the time the first full length came out, it seems like you guys were sharing vocal duties, almost a Beatles-esque sort of thing. Yes, I suppose, it, well, it was generally just me and Martin, but Bob did something like, um, I Can't Stay Long. Martin sang, uh, I don't think he sang on Al- uh, Martin Dempsey, he sang on a B-side, uh, is it, uh, did he, no, he sang, uh, Secret Agent, which is an old Olympic song. So, um, yes, it was good for everybody to have a bit, it was, but it was basically, I think Martin had the sweeter voice, so I, there's probably some that I couldn't do, and I, even though I wrote them, I'd say, this is for you, for something yachting type, it was quite a simple melody, and, and, and maybe, maybe with a bit, again, a sort of wry, feel to it I I was possibly the one that could put it over better you know because I um but you know he'd sing he probably sang sang more than me but strangely I seem to get more of the singles I don't know why (laughs) what was that transition like for you from stiff to radar records because you know radar is no longer rooted in the pub rock scene it's a much more um current sounding label I suppose but at the same time you've still got Nick and Elvis alongside you what was it like um to move from one label to the other well, I say so. We'd been dropped by Stiff, so we were uh, we were floundering um, for well, probably a good six nine months ago. Just gigging, we we're just getting out there gigging um, and developing ourselves as 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 a, a four piece with um, you know two main lead singers. And I suppose we still had the songs that we'd had with John, and I was coming up with new songs, um, like with for instance, as I say, only those three songs that I mentioned. Did we, John, write any others? Um, if you think, that's all we had. So we must have written a, the rest of the first album after John left in November 77. So 78 was all, obviously about, uh, I suppose, me developing a writing style, which was this slightly wry, as you know, tantamount to bribery. If we could get a, if we could get a, a, a funny lyric in there. It was always a funny word or a word that nobody else would use. We love doing that. I still love it. And I still love bands that do it, you know. Um, but yes, yeah, so we were just gigging out there. When I say floundering, we weren't floundering because we were still getting audiences and still playing London, possibly. I mean, look at my diary. I think, have you got the box set, the Yachts box set? I actually don't. I have the albums on vinyl, but I don't have the box set yet. Oh, well, it's, it's signed copies available from my website. I'm going to go order one as soon as we hang up. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, so with all those songs were basically, dev- uh, yeah, what I was going to say that on the, on the uh, booklet that, that I, I got my, I found my diary from 1978 and there's a, I mean, there's a few, you know, I, I photocopied it, uh, scanned it and we were in London sometimes about five times a month. I mean, you just, we were just hammering it, hammering it. And so I suppose, Word was getting out that hey, they've lost the the, the charismatic frontman, but they're still good. And uh, Andrew Lauder at at uh, Radar just so it was Jake and Andrew and Martin Davis. So uh, and Jake had um, Nick and at Elvis, and we were sort of more with Andrew. Andrew Lauder was that was our sort of you know the, our torchbearer. He was fantastic. Again, another person you sort of think. I think back the important people who. Without whom well, I wouldn't be here. And it, it is, it's, it's Roger Eagle from Eric's. It's, it's Clive Langer for, for saying, why don't you write your own songs? And me going, well, how do you do that? And it's, it's Paul Conroy for signing us at Stiff. And it's Andrew Lauder, you know, and, um, and after that, Pete Fulwell, who was at Eric's at the beginning, but didn't know he wasn't, he was a bit behind the scenes. But then he managed me from 1980. No, 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 1982 onwards, basically, until he died earlier this year, sadly. I'm so that there's a, a, a sort of five people in my life, and as I say, um, 
Andrew Lauder at Rado is definitely one of the most important ones. One of the concerts that I love reading about uh, is when you and Clive Langer and the Boxes um, went out on a boat for a Radar Records label showcase, and uh, you guys each played a set, but uh, you know the real news of that uh, event was when Elvis Costello got up and played uh, an acoustic set. What do you remember about that showcase? Yeah, surprise, surprise guest. Yeah, that was again. That was uh, that was fantastic. It was the, the launch of the the our first album, and I think uh, yeah, Fat Elvis on there probably got all the headlines, and nobody was interested in that. But it was great, and it was just going up and down the Royal Iris with this, this old this boat. Sadly, now I saw pictures of it last week on Facebook. It's just this wreck somewhere on the Thames in London, and people somebody took a photo, and it just looked very sad. And it was great fun, you know, captive audience. They couldn't get off, and um, yeah, I think it was was it Clive on first, and then suddenly, oh right, well, there's somebody here, and the people go what? Because he kept out of sight, you know. So it was a bit special. Now you worked with a big name producer um, on the yacht's full length for Radar. Richard Gotterin. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and he had just done some uh, really important albums, whether it was Blondie's first album or uh, Richard Hell and the Voidoids, Blank Generation. Yeah, I listened to that the other day. I listened to that Richard Hell, uh, Blank Generation the other day. Yeah, yes, well, we'd done our first, so after the first Will Birch one, we did some more recording with Will. In fact, I found it the other day, the demos, and it obviously wasn't working. Maybe that's what, you know, that, I'm just thinking that, that's what will have happened. Stiff sent us in with Will Birch because it worked really well. And I did listen to them the other day and I thought, no, I probably wouldn't have signed this. And I think we needed to go away, play the songs in, work with a different producer. Now, Clive Langer was, you know, our mate two years ahead of us at the art college. And I think I could be wrong. You've already interviewed him. But he'll, be, he'll be able to tell us. I think we were the first production he did. I could, I could be wrong there. But so he did um, yachting, yachting types with an S. Uh, and I Can't Stay Long, and he did Look Back in Love. Yes, I think he did. Yes, he did all those uh, those three, um, and there was a, must be another B-side somewhere. Um, and it, it is interesting. I always thought, what would it have been like um, if Clive had done the whole album? Because I loved the, what, what he did. And But uh, coming back to it now, with because, you know, I remember when, when we'd done the first album, I was thinking, should we? I mean, it's great, but it probably rocked a bit more than I wanted it to. But now I listen to it, it was absolutely perfect. It was perfect for trying to break the states. And we did, we had a good go at it. We had a good fist of it. We were like the most added on band on the billboard, you know, third most added on band or something like that. And it was breaking out everywhere. And we were thinking, wow, here we go. Uh, and probably the Clive Lang versions might have been too English. So I think, you know, it was a, uh, the right decision. And again, another thing where they said, oh, you're going to work with Richard Gotter. And I went, wow, he wrote, I, mean, I know I'm a nerd, probably like you, you know, I mean, I when I was your age, I was even more of a nerd. And I was like, wow, he wrote my boyfriend's back and hang on Sloopy. And he produced the private stock Blondie album. Wow. Yeah. And so I was absolutely made. I think maybe I might've suggested, it. I don't know how it came about, but he came over to England and we did a, uh, a couple of days, I think, in a rehearsal studio, and it seemed to go well. And the next thing we knew, uh, you know, we were flown out to to, to New York. So we, we'd done two, I think we'd had two singles released with Clive Langer. Um, so that would have been in 70, would that be early 79, late 78? Because it probably took us a year to get the, the, the radar deal, you know, under our bells, and then probably a bit of demoing or whatever with Clive and then recording. So, I mean, it'll be, in, it'll be in the history book somewhere. It's probably 78 is probably, 78, 79, um, Look Back in Love and Yachting Types. And then we went over and worked with Richard Gotter. And the second album, that came out late 1979, early 1980? I think 80. I th- oh, hang on, it could be 70. Well, hang on, the first album came out in 79, so unless we rush back in. No, it'd have to be 80. It would be 80, yeah. Yeah, because we supported The Who in, in 1980, so and we were doing... I, I found a set list the other day. We were doing songs from the second album, so yes, it would have been the second album, uh, 1980. That Who tour must have been incredible. What was that like? Well, I suppose, yes, The Who doing a tour of Europe was a pretty amazing. I mean, I, I always wonder, I think, how the hell did we get that? Apparently, we back in the day, you'd send cassettes in. We sent a cassette in, or our manager did, 
and Pete Townsend liked it. And we found ourselves on tour with the Who, um, which was mind blowing. You know, again, I was I was a big Who fan, and um, they were just uh, you know, okay. obviously we, we were in our own dressing and that, but they popped their heads in. Pete, all right, lads, you know. And then we'd hear fighting and glass being smashed, and then somebody would say, oh. Oh, Pete's left the tour. It's all, it's actually recorded. He he did apparently. We were told, well, what? I, I, we said well, he's left. He's flown home. But there's also a story that he hitchhiked to Burn Zoo. Look it up, and and it also became it became a um, the basis of one of his songs on a solo album. And so he was found by the bear cage at Burn Zoo in the morning. Five. I don't know, but it's a good tale. We heard that he was so pissed off he'd flown home. Which isn't quite such a good tale. So whether this tale was made up, and then, and we thought, well, are we still carrying on? And then two days later, off the day off, he was back. So yeah, yeah. it was a lot of fireworks. You could uh, you could you know, it got me you got me ready for years with the Christians, my other band, yeah. <laughs> my band of brothers. Yes, tricky. It's tricky being in a band. It's even trickier being in a band of brothers. And I think the Who probably again they were like fire and water. It was like sparks all the time. But it was great fun. And great to be able to see them at that close every night. And I've got some photos, I don't know if you've seen on my Facebook, but I've got photos of me, you know, from here to that door away, from right at, underneath, getting to, with the scissor kick and all that. Um, so, yeah, I was loving it. Thinking who else? We, we were supporting Costello a lot. Um, with Joe Jackson, we did a few, uh, we did some gigs with him. I've got the T-shirt from Victoria and Vancouver. And then we went went down to LA after that, and he must have been playing because in Midari, I have no recollection of this. He got up and sang our encore, Twenty Four Hours from Tulsa, with us. <laughs> no record. And, and there's another one, Reckless Eric did the same. Joint would join us. And one another gig, uh, Bonnie Raitt was uh, was in the club and asked if she could go and, and use our gear and do a little twenty minute set. No recollection. I speak to Martin Dempsey. He said, "Don't you remember that?" They said, "Good night." No record. So thank God I got my diaries, which are which are hilarious, absolutely hilarious. I'm trying to think who else we supported in yachts. Uh, the tourists, who of course became Eurythmics, and uh, I remember uh, in Camden Market by Camden Market when we were wandering through me and Martin Watson and um, Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart were there, and they and they recognised from doing the tour because they're lovely people. I went, hi, hi, how are you? How are you? Yeah, and it possibly felt like, you know, uh, your band splits up, poor you. You know, we, we, look, we thought we were still going places. And I said, uh, so uh, what are you up to? Formed a new band. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's it called? Eurythmics. And then that no. night, I'm thinking, nowhere with a name like that. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I knew, bloody hell, you know, we'd split up and they were at the top of the charts. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we, it's a, but I suppose we were just doing, mainly we were just doing little gigs in clubs and, you know, pubs in London and whatever, uh, and universities, yeah, colleges. Um, in, the, in the States, there were the, the odd sort of support gig, but generally we were doing, just doing our own gigs, you know. And then after that second album and all that touring, um, that was kind of the end of Yachts, wasn't it? Yeah, we did one, we, we did one more single uh, for Andrew Lauder for a Demon Records, A Fool Like You. And um, and then it was I, I was also playing this band It's a Material, which was me getting back with my old friend and singer John Campbell, and I just started thinking this is more exciting than what I'm doing now. So I sort of jumped ship and uh, wasn't a writer in It's a Material. So in a way, it was a it was a bit of a, a bit of respite for me. I was quite I I, I likened myself to the Brian Jones of the band. So what you want some marimba? I can play. You you want some sax? I can play. You want some clarinet? I can play. I can play all these instruments badly, you know. Um, and obviously, I was playing a lot of keys with them, uh, but I wasn't writing. Uh, and then, of course, a few years later, that was frustrating because I, I want to write. I want to write, you know. And then after that, you joined your most commercially successful project. Yeah, the Christians were th the three brothers, Roger, Gary, and Russell were on this song of it's a material which became a single they were they were the backing vocals and i'd i'd actually been in the studio and recorded them um for this particular song and at the end there were five brothers initially and at the end i said would you like to hear some of my songs and two of them said they had tennis to go and play uh, and a game of tennis and three of them stayed and um 
you know, then we just car carried on working. I had all, had all these songs. What is funny is, is a, I remember there's a, a DJ in, in, um, in Britain who was on Radio 1 at the time, a friend of mine, a Janice Long, and she said, uh, I said, I'm just looking for some sort of, I said, I can't sing these songs, but I've got all these songs, I don't know who to, she said, you could do worse than try that, uh, that, that ginger lad, uh, you know, from uh, the Frantic Elevators, and of course it was Mick Hucknall from, who would go on to be in Simply Red, so that would have been a, a different, you know, and then another one was, and I did go and knock on his door, Wayne Hussey from um, The Mission, and, or, or the, uh, was he in the cult? Was he, was he in the cult at some point? Sudden death cult. And uh, again, that would be, you know, as goth as you can get. How would that have worked? I've no idea. I mean, even people probably like yourself going, hang on, what's the, what's the link between, well, at first all three bands, but especially Yachts and the Christians. Ironically, what I'm doing now is closer to Yachts than, than anything I've done before, because it's, it's, again, it's rye lyrics. I mean, it's not as poppy. It's probably more sort of folky singer-songwriter, but yes, I've probably reverted back to there a bit. The Christians was really... Uh, I suppose, my, uh, my successful period. <laughs> now, recently, a couple of weeks ago, you posted on Facebook uh, an acoustic um, sort of crowdsourced version of Suffice to Say, uh, which I thought was just wonderful. I, I, I couldn't believe that when I saw it. Can you talk a little bit about how that came together? Yeah, it was. you know what? It was just totally off the top of my head. I, I started doing these shed sessions, and for me, they've been a way of getting through this COVID thing. And I have been trying to... Without getting too muso, I am a crap guitarist. So I've learned this new tuning in D major. See, I don't have to even think, I don't know what it is, my brain doesn't, but it's in D major. And it suddenly makes me sound quite good. And I sound quite, and people go, is that, is that your own guitar? I go, yeah, it is, I love you, you know it is. So I've been doing all these, revisiting them, which makes them sound better because there are drones and I, it makes them sound better i've been slowing them down then probably more so lowering the key for my voice so with that particular one i just started playing around well i could take it really gently and i had to say to the band you know the people who were sending in their bands, I said, just listen to it i said we're we're, we're not we're not doing that you know um and it, people absolutely loved it i mean i, I might even do a, a put a little album out of the shed sessions uh, I'm going to be doing yacht, yacht, yachting type um, next week. I've done my bits, uh, and there's a sort of nod. I think they're very because there's not there's hardly anything electric on any of the shed sessions. As a nod to yachts, I've um, done the little moog. I've got my mini moog out and got bang hole, bang hole, and that's all you'll see. It's just all the square of my fingers doing that at the beginning. So that's a little nod to the yachts fans, and we've got a bit of a. Uh, a, a celeb, well, a lovely person from who's on British TV, a big film buff called Mark Kermode. And, um, you know, he has 600 Twitter followers. So it's fabulous that if he, and he loves the band and he's, he's, and he's agreed to play bass on it. So I'm absolutely, so that will hopefully, touch wood, that will all happen in the next week. We just, uh, again, you, you just behold him to what, who can do it and who fancies it. And, you know, I do my bit. So do you fancy doing this? You know, but uh, they've been great for me. So, yeah, I've just been revisiting a lot of the songs, even the Christians ones, which were possibly more solely and faster. And uh, and uh, my wife said I did a song called Ideal World, which was a hit over here in, in the UK in 1987. And when I started doing it solo or just or it was a duo, she went, wow. They said, she said, that's a real, real protest song. I've never really listened to the lyrics because so first thing with the Christians, it was so beautifully sung and the production, all that 80s production, which was all the rage then. And I can't fault it. it, it we know, it, it went triple platinum, that album. Mm -hmm. um, it's enabling me to afford these, these CDs. So, um, but it wasn't until I'd actually stripped it down and just played it with a guitar that my wife realised, started listening to the lyric, you know. I think what's different is the way I write songs now and the way I write, wrote songs then. Actually, that's not right, because with Yachts a lot, but I definitely start with a lyric more now, or start with a title, which I probably didn't then. I would start with music, and then I'd put the lyrics to it. But it's great fun revisiting them. I didn't think I would revisit the Yachts ones, or even the Christians ones. And then I've started just putting a few in, and people are loving them. And we did, a, say, when the Yachts um, box set came out, we did a special gig in London with this chap, Mark Kermit, on bass. And that was fabulous. We just did six songs, and then we got the original lineup, stiff lineup. Well, uh, the three 
I'd lost contact with one. And what was nice is only two weeks ago, I found, found Martin Watson. And I thought, I thought there must have been some weirdness because he wasn't responding. But I, I think he must have gone. He just said himself he went through a bit of a tough time 20 years ago. So I, again, so um, yeah, we, we got the Martin Dempsey, the bassist, and John Campbell and myself together. And we did Suffice to Say, which was a nice little moment. That was in Liverpool. We just did that in Liverpool. It was good. Yeah, it was good fun. But again, people go, why, why, why don't you reform the band? Yeah, not going to do that. It'd be rubbish. Henry, it's been a real pleasure. When I first started, you know, working my way through Stiff's discography, uh, suffice to say, it's one of those songs that really just jumped out and grabbed me. And I was so excited to learn that there were two more full lengths behind it because so many of the bands on Stiff were sort of one and done. But you guys have two exceptional LPs. And, uh, you know, again, everything from the lyrics to the music, um, really, it's been a, an absolute joy to discover your back catalogue. Well, what was funny is, is, it's funny, you wouldn't have thought that, uh, you know, people from your neck of the wood would, would be getting the, the, the lyrics, but they actually enjoy them more than the British. Well, definitely in a cool way. We were cool in, in the US and we were getting written about in Trouser Press and this, and, you know, we were a cool band. And, um, and, and in England, because we weren't, you know, we weren't the Clash or the Damned or, or Gang of Four or whatever, though we loved all that, that's not what we do and that's not what I can write. We weren't taken seriously and we, and we were just like, oh yeah, for about, I remember there's a Paul Morley. <laughs> It's funny the fact that I can remember it and it's looked back in love and it goes something like bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. And that was about the whole review, you know, you go, okay, right. <laughs> but now, but in the States, I'd say yeah, there's a, there's a, I think I've got it up there. Here you go. I've got, it's a Gene Scalati, who uh, is now a Facebook fan. I couldn't believe it. He, he actually asked to just, Gene Scalati, we're in the catalogue of cool. And I think we're next to, I can't, I won't be able to find it in time, but. We are next to VW, so we're next to Tom Waits, Velvet Underground, and Yachts. And he says that I'm the Cole Porter of punk, you know. And that is fantastic. So people got it over there. They loved all that. And what was funny was hearing all the, um, the you know, they do the adverts for the album. And they'd always do it in a very, very, here, here the Yachts are here. And they splice the main brace, and they're here to, oh, it was all those puns dreadful in a real plummy English accent. And of course, when we went over there, and two of the band were from Liverpool, they loved all that, and they loved the English accents anyway. So yeah, we just, we did that. We were made to feel really at home in the States, and we'd come back to England and be like, oh, a bit of a treadmill here, they don't get us here. So and that's, it's funny that you should say that you were, you got into it and you got the humour, you know. Well, and I have to tell you, my favorite Yacht song that I think is the perfect synthesis of a an incredibly catchy rock song with very wry, humorous, um, dark lyrics is Box 202. Do you know why it's called Box 202? Because Radio Merseyside, which was our local radio, was 202 medium wave. So we thought, right, if we call it 202, they might, they might use it on other... <laughs> There's always method, you know. We, we, we were sus, me and Bob. That was me and um, the late Bob Bellis wrote that. And we had such a laugh. Uh, what, some overworked, thoughtless fool said that you had clocked. I mean, the lyrics are just bonkers. Lyrically, it's unlike uh, any other song I've ever heard. Did you Have you got the version when it does this sort of spark is magic, the vocoder bit in between that? Or is it just the hell chord? I don't know the version with the uh, vocoder yet. Oh, well, well it's, that was a single, I think, came out in, and it goes, um, Vox 202, now the version, you know, it just holds for a bit, doesn't it? And um, the record company got scared, and so there's a, uh, do you know, would you, you won't know a song called Sparky's Magic Piano, do you? No, I don't. Oh, right, it's, it's a kid's, let me play, you know, so it's me with a, using a vocoder going, Box two or two, uh, was it? It's me being uh, send, you know, put your details in, and we'll send it back to you. And it's cheesy. I'm thinking. I listen now. Go. Oh God, no. I'm gonna have to go listen to that now. I really need the box set. Well, this it's it's I mean, for me on the box set, I think number three is is um, CD three. It's the rarities. Chuddy Noddies is on there, which is great. 
the, the rarities and the, the B size, I, I probably enjoy that as much as anything. And that's quite interesting because a lot of them are, you know, self-produced. It's that thing of going in with the B side. I'll be, I'll be interested to hear what you think of because some, a lot of people are going, that's that CD3. I love it. You know, I suppose it's because it's singles and B sides, so it's quite poppy. Some of the ones, were. but the B sides, I love the and with the obscure things like Hazy People, um, Secret Agents, the one that Martin sang. You know. They, covering things that people didn't know these songs. So it was good fun. And we're just going in there. I always think these sides are sometimes the best because you don't even, you don't care about. It's something I didn't realize until I started collecting vinyl, how many exclusive, um, you know, rare, obscure songs you can only get, um, you know, on, on a seven inch like that. Obscure, exactly, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Beatles and Stones, and Kinks, the Kinks B-sides. Big black smoke and things like that were just amazing. Yes, you're right. I've not really no, I've not really realised that. Of course, there's a whole generation that doesn't understand what the word B side means. You know. <laughs> well, it's great that you've collected those again. I cannot wait to hear that disc three. Yeah, I mean, I am wondering whether to. Uh, there is a definitely albums worth, if not more, uh, of demos we did around the time of. Did you get Fool Like You? Have you got that single? No, my collection of Yachts 45s uh, has some gaps in it. So that was the last thing we did, but we did a whole, I mean, obviously it would have been album three. And I do wonder whether, you know, to get the cassettes, clean them up. And I've, I, you know, I've got digital facilities to do that, whether there'd be interest. I, I need to listen to them and see if they're any good. You know, I haven't listened to them for, for a while. And I do need to, di I need to digitize them too, so that they're saved, you know. But that, that, that is the thing I've thought about over the lockdown period. I thought, you know, I, sh I should be, I should be, you know, put, putting a yacht thing together. So I've got all these cassettes. So watch this space. It might happen. And Les, my guitarist, is a huge yachts fan. He came to see us back in the day uh, when, when he did his um, rehearsal to see how, whether we'd work together. He started playing yachting type. And I went, how do you know that? He said, oh, I used to love yachts. I went, did you? You're the only person I know who did. Anyway, so we're, no, good. I'll, I'll let you know if it come if if it, if it makes it. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. And until then, Henry, thank you again for taking the time to talk. This has been a fantastic way to kick off uh, this little uh, series of Stiff Records um, episodes of the podcast. When I think Stiff Records, suffice to say, is the song that starts playing in my head. As many great songs as they've released, as many great artists as they had signed, um, for me, it's all about suffice to say that's one of the early singles and uh, to me it just perfectly synthesizes the humor the rock and roll the attitude uh the the sarcasm or wryness as henry said um to me that that song is the perfect stiff record single so uh with that being said i'm going to wrap up this first episode um, again, we've got some great guests coming up in the future. I've, I've already had some wonderful conversations that really help peel back the mythology on Stiff Records, and I really can't wait to share those with you guys. So, um, as always, thank you for listening. I'm Charles Epting. This is the Lost Labels Podcast. Until next time.